I would like to do three things today. The first is to recognize all of you, the dedicated researchers, the dedicated policy workers who are fighting for the future of the planet. You are the unsung heroes. The second reason I wanted to be here is to lend my voice of support to Eve. And I would like to um, uh, then do the third thing, which is to give you an update on something similar that we're working on called Earth 2. Eve, as you know, stands for Earth Virtualization, another way of saying digital twin. Earth 2 is a digital twin of Earth climate. There's a reason why we worked on it, and the reason for that was because of some groundbreaking technologies that we were seeing that might help to contribute to the work that you do. And so today, the third, uh, the third thing I'd like to do is to give you an update of Earth 2 and uh, introduce a few tools that you might keep in your toolbox that might inspire you uh, to use uh, in solving uh, your climate, uh, climate challenges. Uh, Richard Feynman once said that uh, what I can't create, I don't understand. And that's the reason why climate modeling is so important. If you don't understand it, how can you possibly understand the human impact to Earth's climate? And so the work that you do is vitally important to policymakers, to researchers, to the industry. And yet, it is one insanely complicated problem. The physics is complicated. It is tied, obviously, to the capabilities of the computer industry. And as we advance computing, the level of approximation that you have to do reduces over time. But the amount of approximation you have to do today is still quite significant. We recognize that models of different fidelity and different resolutions have different use. We understand very well that at 100 kilometers, at 25 kilometers, we might be able to predict that the Earth is warming, that greenhouse gases contributes to this warming, and that human activity is the cause. And that alone, your evangelism, uh, talking about the challenges that this is going to create for society, has activated all kinds of activities already. We need to do more. But you have done so much. The fact of the matter is, those hundreds of thousands of research papers were inspired by all of you talking about the importance of climate change. For what other reason would so many researchers be advancing this field, dedicating their life's work to it? It's precisely your work that has inspired all of that. So I want to thank you for that, first of all. Understanding the mean temperature of Earth mobilized a great many areas of mitigation. It is the reason why so many different industries are moving towards sustainable energy. It is the reason why so many climate tech companies have been founded for pre- and post-carbon capture. There are all kinds of amazing conversations being had. Because of the modeling work, because of the understanding of climate change that you have elevated, mitigation is no longer enough. Adaptation is necessary. Adaptation is at human scales. In order for us to help society adapt, when, how severe, where, those kind of questions require a resolution of fidelity that we simply cannot achieve at 25 kilometers. And so my story is going to start with Bjorn Stevens' uh, GTC 2022 in March. Uh, he gave an example of the devastating 2021 floods in Germany. And the scale of that, of course, is human scale. EVE is a fantastic idea. But in order to make EVE happen, it requires several miracles. Um, as it stands today, as it stands today, EVE, without advancement in computing, EVE is impossible. Using traditional methods, EVE will be impossible within all of our lifetimes, which is precisely the reason why I think Bjorn got so excited and the Eve team got so excited. There are three miracles that has to happen. The first one is how can we take a traditional method of simulation, uh, increase its resolution to a couple of kilometers or a kilometer square, 30,000 simulated years per year um, would take about on the order 
uh, depending on your estimation, nearly a billion watts, 750 million watts. Um, basically, every single data center on the planet would have to join forces uh, to, to even have a chance at doing something like that. Um, so obviously, we have to refactor the way computing is done, introduce a new method of doing computing. The second thing is, how would you even interact with that data? The pre-computing that is done to re even retrieve the simulation data to be able to interact with it uh, would, would be enormous amounts of data. Uh, and the third thing, of course, is how would you visualize all of this data because it takes pretty powerful workstations and supercomputers to be able to visualize the information today. How would we put that in the hands of policymakers, uh, businesses, companies, researchers, so that they could do what-if experiments uh, at the regional level and to understand the impact of that storm, uh, maybe to their coastal regions, maybe to their uh, farms, maybe to their infrastructure that they're building. How would they even explore that uh, unless they have these powerful workstations and powerful visualization systems. And so these three miracles um, have to be addressed. And the reason why Earth 2 and Eve uh, found each other in the perfect time is because Earth 2 is based on three fundamental computing uh, breakthroughs. The first one is accelerated computing. There are two dynamics that are happening in the computer industry as we speak. The computer industry has been using a computing model uh, that is largely unchanged since the IBM System 360 was invented 60 years ago. General purpose computing has the benefit of Moore's Law for several decades, and as a result, computing has improved in, in performance every five years by a factor of 10, every 10 years by a factor of 100. And so at that pace, the world was able to absorb the amount of increase in computing demand while keeping the amount of energy that was used in data centers largely invisible to the amount of energy used on the planet until about the last couple of two, three years. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, data center compute, data center power has now reached about 2%. And the reason for that is because CPU scaling has ended, and yet demand continued to rise. And so where NVIDIA comes in, and the reason why uh, our computing approach is adopted all over the world is because we can deliver a quantum leap in computational capability while reducing the amount of energy used. The second area of contribution is physics ML. Using machine learning, using AI to learn the properties of physics, we know how to use AI to learn the properties of language, learn the properties of speech, but what if we also use it to learn physics? Modulus allows us to learn physics. Uh, along with that, we have to invent a new type of AI model to forecast climate. And the third is a digital twin system we call Omniverse. Let me just share with you uh, some of the progress that we've made there. Accelerated computing, this is a new type of computer. This new processor uh, took us nearly a decade to do. And we call it Grace Hopper. It's the world's first tightly coupled CPU and GPU and makes it possible for us to accelerate just about any software. Uh, the first application of Grace Hopper is our climate software and I'm very much looking forward to seeing ICON and IFS uh, running on Grace Hopper. Uh, the, the, the amount of performance is, is fairly insane, but let me, let me just show it to you this way. Uh, if you look at the gray bar, that's a CPU. That's one CPU. The light green bar on the right-hand side, that's one Grace Hopper. Uh, Grace Hopper can perform uh, these type of applications, and this is data analytics, vector databases, uh, basically a semantic database, graph neural network, large language model like ChatGPT. Um, it can perform these type of applications, algorithms, uh, substantially faster with uh, much, much better energy efficiency. Uh, for example, the large language model of LAMA can be performed at 200 times better energy efficiency. This is not your normal computer. It requires the software to be rewritten for this type of computer uh, from the ground up. But if you're able to do so, the amount of energy efficiency you can get is really spectacular. This is what it looks like in the system. If you wanted to create a, a supercomputer out of this, uh, you take one Grace Hopper, you connect these Grace Hoppers using a special link that it connects a whole bunch of them into one giant computer. All of its memories are connected. It's one virtual GPU. 256 GPUs, 150 miles of optical cable, 40,000 pounds. And to the software, it is one chip. You program it like one giant GPU. We're building it now. We're going to try to use this computer to um, simulate ICON. This is very, very early code. Um, I'm sure it's going to get a lot better. But on the left-hand side, 
It's 2,140 CPUs. It can simulate 40 days per day. On the right is 1,536 Grace Hopper, the super chip on the left. And we can simulate 722 days per day using the same amount of power. In both cases, it's one megawatt. The first problem that we have is in order to simulate 30,000 days per day or 30,000 years per year, we would need 750 megawatts. We can now do it 20 times better than that. Now, 20 times better than that isn't quite 30 megawatts, but it is very, very close. So the first miracle is we should be able to do that within about 30, 40 megawatts. Um, the second miracle is um, using AI. And we created a framework that is designed to learn physics, uh, learn the structure uh, of physics, and to be able to predict the climate. And we invented a model called ForecastNet. Climate researchers at NVIDIA uh, partnering with researchers at uh, Caltech. And uh, this model uh, is based on a neural operator uh, that's Fourier based, Fourier neural operator, so that it can learn continuous functions and learn relationships from very large spans of time and space. And the results are very uh, physical and it re reflects um, the skills of a good weather predictor and a good climate predictor. And so the question is whether these um, models reflect physics. And um, one way is to look at the realism um, and try to reforecast uh, historical extremes. This is Hurricane uh, Harvey. And you can see that the skills uh, reflect uh, climate behavior. You could also see that it has learned the physical properties of climate and of physics uh, in this particular case, uh, the Coriolis effect. Uh, it turns to the right in the northern hemisphere and it turns to the left in the southern hemisphere. It also seems to uh, predict rather well the internal temperatures of the hurricane and the wind speed. So what can you do with the models? Bjorn hypothesized that we could use the physical models to simulate a trajectory of climate. You could checkpoint it, and in this particular case, we checkpoint it uh, monthly. We trained the model using ERA-5 data. This is trained on ERA-5. And then we tested it against emulated the 2018 Berlin climate in this particular case. As you could see, it generated some trajectories that are uh, quite believable. The blue is ground truth. It's uh, able to do a fairly good job uh, generating statistical uh, climate. This is Buenos Aires. And as you could see, uh, it's, it has reasonably good skills uh, in predicting climate. And this is in Tokyo it takes the pressure off of the numerical simulation by a factor of two. Every time we can roll it out by another 30 days, the number of checkpoints we have to do is reduced. And what used to be uh, 30 megawatts could be 15 megawatts. Here, we ask ourselves, what is the incredible capability that AI can uh, perform that, frankly, simulation approaches simply cannot afford to do. And of course, one of its abilities is large ensembles. And to be able to make predictions um, of a large number of different statistics, and maybe uh, one of those uh, reflects uh, an extreme uh, weather condition that otherwise wouldn't have been predicted. And so let's play this video, it's really interesting. Extreme weather events are increasing in frequency and severity. In 2018, the temperature in Algeria reached 51.3 Celsius the hottest ever recorded in Africa and beyond what existing models predicted. The actual recorded temperature is shown here in orange. As you can see, the actual temperatures exceeded the 99th percentile shown by the dashed line. The yellow line represents ForecastNet's forecast for the daily maximum temperature. This is a 50-member ensemble from ForecastNet. That's the typical size of a numerical weather prediction ensemble and it takes an hour for a large supercomputer to generate. None of the gray lines cross the 99th percentile. Because extreme events are rare, large ensembles are needed to predict them with any kind of accuracy. With a small ensemble, outcomes are simply missed. By running ForecastNet on NVIDIA GPUs, however, we were able to generate a thousand ensemble members in one-tenth the amount of time it previously took to do one, and with significantly lower energy consumption. 12 members of that ensemble exceeded the 99th percentile and correctly predicted the heat wave. 
Here are the spatial maps of the heat waves predicted by those 12 ensemble members. Using AI, we were able to predict this high impact event a full three weeks in advance. Tapping into GPU acceleration to dramatically increase ensemble size can give us deeper visibility into extreme weather around the world and valuable time to prepare. And so the second miracle is to be able to interact at very high resolution regional scales and a level of computation that's just simply unimaginable. Five kilometer resolution would take 4,000 of the H100s. It would take about three days to train this model. And every time you want to inference it, you can generate a thousand ensembles at five kilometer resolution, probably better than that, uh, within about an hour. That is simply unachievable using numerical simulations. And you simply wouldn't put that capability in the hands of tens of thousands of people. And so AI gives you an or a three orders of magnitude uh, speed up in capability. The second big breakthrough is using artificial intelligence uh, to learn the properties of physics and use it for uh, climate prediction. Uh, third has to do with digital twins. Let me show you our latest work. This, um, uh, this is now available in the cloud. Uh, we have it uh, running in, in 100 countries, and you should be able to uh, interact with it uh, once we open up the service so that you can interact with it on your PC, on your tablet, on your phone. And so we'll show you now for the very first time. This is simulation data courtesy of uh, Bjorn Stevens. Accurately visualizing current weather conditions in high resolution and at a global scale is incredibly helpful to climate scientists. Using NVIDIA Omniverse Cloud, we can look at an icon simulation of any part of the world at a resolution of 1.25 kilometer. Here, you can see the detail in the clouds over Taiwan, or thunderstorms over Africa that form as the sun rises and its light strikes the clouds in that area. Typical simulations today are done at 25 kilometer resolution and simply can't show these details. Observing the climate in high resolution at a global scale is a powerful tool, but it's also important to be able to show the impacts to specific regions or even to specific areas of a city. Here's a simulation of Ernst Reuter Platz in Berlin, where we can see how the size and location of buildings impact airflows based on data from Palm and volumetric data from ICOM. This simulation power gives architects and city planners insights into how they can design and build smarter, more sustainable cities, while letting climate scientists gain a deeper understanding of our changing world. Everything interactive. And so this is what we imagine EVE to be someday. This is kind of a, a, a nice realization of it today. Uh, you should be able to integrate um, uh, physically-based simulations, uh, AI-based, AI-driven um, climate uh, uh, emulations, and uh, to be able to visualize, uh, pick your year out in the future, uh, pick the storm that you would like to study, uh, pick the region that you're at, um, and interact with it uh, just as you were looking at just now. And you'll be looking at the future You'll be looking uh, into the future as if you're enjoying today's weather. We had the benefit of collaborating with uh, weather and climate scientists around the world, but I'd like to highlight a few that we interacted with it on a regular basis. Uh, Bjorn Stevens at the Max Planck Institute, Peter Bauer, Peter Dubin, Paco de Blas Reyes at um, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Niels Wady at the uh, ECMWF. We're building three types of brand new supercomputers the one in the back is for training the AI models. The one in the middle is for simulating physical properties. The one that's in front is your omniverse cloud computer. These three new types of supercomputers are just now coming online. And on top of it, we're going to overlay our Earth 2 cloud services that I showed you earlier and hopefully be able to contribute to EVE. And so with that, I thought uh, this morning I wrote you guys a mission statement for EVE. It kind of goes like this. Earth, the final frontier. These are the voyages of Eve. It's five-year mission to push the limits of computing in service of climate modeling, to seek out new methods and new technologies, to study global to local state of climate, 
to inform today the impact of mitigation and adaptation on Earth's tomorrow, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Thank you.